we can lift our hands and say thank you. You're awesome God. You have been good to us. You provide for us. You protect us throughout the week. And we are here in this your blessed holy day to lift up your name in praise. Here's the step of those who are on their way. Tune our voices as we sing heaven words. May heaven come down and glory fill our souls, we pray. For the forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus' name. Amen. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Well, angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. I said, what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Well, angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. He never failed me yet. He never fails me yet. Jesus Christ never fails me yet. For anywhere I go, I want the world to know. Jesus Christ never fails me yet. He never fails me yet. He never fails me yet. Jesus Christ never fails me yet. For anywhere I go, I want the world to know. Jesus Christ never fails me yet. Oh, redeem. When the burden of sin was lost, redeem. When my soul condemned to die, redeem. For the price I could not pay, redeem. Hallelujah, redeem. Oh, redeem. When the burden of sin was lost. Yes, redeem. When my soul condemned to die, redeem. For the price I could not pay, redeem. Hallelujah, redeem. Oh, what a wonderful thing, a very wonderful thing to be free from sin and have Christ within just to be as joint tell with Jesus my Lord. What a wonderful, wonderful thing. Oh, what a wonderful thing, a very wonderful thing to be free from sin and of Christ within just to be as joint ill with Jesus my Lord. What a wonderful, wonderful thing. As everybody ought to know, Everybody got to know, everybody got to know who Jesus is. Everybody got to know, some people don't. Everybody got to know, everybody got to know who Jesus is. I said he is the lily of the lily of the valley. He's as bright as morning star, morning star. He You got to move, you got to move. Oh, you may be rich, you may be poor, you may be black, you may be white. When God gets ready, you got to move, you got to move. Yes, I said I feel like pressing, I feel like pressing, I feel like pressing my way. I'm on my way to glory, and I feel like pressing my way. Yes, I said I feel like pressing, I feel like pressing, I feel like pressing my way. On my way to glory, and I feel like pressing up. Redemption coming, praise the Lord. Oh, what a wonderful freedom! Glory to His name. I'm out of the bondage, I'm into that freedom by the blood of Jesus. Praise the Lord. It's soon be done when this trouble 
thousand child When I get over on the other side I'm gonna shake my hands with the elders I'm gonna tell all the people good morning I'm gonna sit down beside my Jesus I'm gonna sit down and rest a little while My Jesus and I, we got a good thing going on My Jesus and I, we got a good thing going on Yeah, no Satan is on my truck Lord, but I'll never, never turn back My Jesus and I, we got a good thing going on well as we travel to this pilgrim land there is a friend who walks with me keep me safely to the safety and it is a path of calvary Said Jesus, hold my hand. Yeah. Bless her, Jesus, hold my oh, as I need, I need the every hour through this land, this pilgrim land. Protect me by that saving hand. Hear my plea, my feeble plea. The 
lifeboat sailing on. If Christ in the vessel, we can smile at the storm, the lifeboat sailing on. Halle, halle, halle. Hallelujah. Yeah, halle, halle, halle. Hallelujah. Yes, halle, halle, halle. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, we must praise the Lord, praise Him, praise the Lord, praise Him. Yes, we thank Him for joy and peace divine. Oh, yeah, for when I was sad and lonely and I didn't know what to do, yes, I thank Him for saving my soul. Oh, we must praise the Lord, praise Him, praise the Lord. Praise Him. Yes, we thank Him for joy and peace divine. Oh, yes. For when I was sad and lonely and I never know what to do. Yes, I thank Him for saving my soul. Well, it is all right. Oh, right. It is all right. Oh, right. As long as I have my Lord beside me, it is all right. As long as He have my hand to hold, as long as He watches over my is control, it's all right. Yes, it is all right, all right. It's all right, all right. As long as I have my Lord beside me, it is all right. As long as He have my hand to hold, as long as He watches over my soul, as long as I'm under His control, it's all right. Something in my heart, like a stream running down. It makes me feel so happy, as happy as can be. For when I think of Jesus and what he has done for me, there is something in my heart like a stream running down. There's something in my heart like a stream running down. Oh, it makes me feel so happy, as happy as can be. For when I think of Jesus and what he has done for me, there is something in my heart like a stream running down. Oh, sweet Jesus, sweet Jesus, what a wonder you are. You are brighter than the morning star. You are fairer, much fairer than the lily that grow by the wayside. You are precious, more precious than gold. I feel like running, skipping, praying. What he has, yeah, he has set my spirit free. I feel like running, running, skipping. Praise the Lord for what he has done for me. But when I think of the goodness of Jesus and what he has done for me, oh, my soul cries out, Hallelujah! Thank God for saving. Amen, amen, praise the Lord. That was Brother Penny Cook in his Elements. What a song service it was. And it seemed as if he could continue all afternoon with such a song service. Thank you very much, Brother Penny Cook. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening. Good whatever time. Uh, it is in your locality. We welcome you to your favorite time of Bible study. It is beyond the surface. It is a time when we dig deep into the word of the Lord. And so if you are joining us from across the lovely country of Jamaica, from the, any of the 14 parishes, from the five um, conferences, we welcome you in a very special way. Those who are joining us for the Caribbean, you are our brothers and sisters and friends. We welcome you in a very special way. And the connection goes. Um, your neighbor is not only the person living next to you, just the person living next to you. Your friends are not 
confined to geographic territory. So we extend the family connection outside of Jamaica and the Caribbean to those who are in the USA, in Canada, in England, and right across the world, even down to Australia and Africa. We welcome you in a very special way. It is a time when the entire world, as a family, we can study the word of the Lord together. So welcome one, welcome all. We are going to get to it because we are at Romans, in the, in the Romans series, a study from the book of Romans, and oh, how powerful our studies have been. I don't know about you, but I am learning a lot from my study of the book of Romans. A number of things are reinforced and emphasized. And last week we did from Romans chapter 8, No Condemnation, part 1. And we told you that we could not finish uh, Romans chapter 8 in one sitting. So we are back with part 2. No condemnation. We, I think we picked, we stopped at verse 17 or 18 last week, and we are going to pick up from right there. And what a study it was. And we last week, you are in for even a special treat through the power of the Holy Spirit this afternoon. And to take us through no condemnation part two, that's Romans chapter 8. We have this afternoon a face, Anna, that you have not seen in a few weeks. And a number of you have been asking um, for him. Uh, his beard is not as long as it was. Uh, so we welcome him, Pastor Dyer, uh, our ministerial secretary. Uh, welcome, Pastor Dyer. Long time they have not seen your face or heard you. Uh, another face and voice that have... Um, went on just a shorter sabbatical than Pastor Dyer, uh, but I know you love him and love to hear his voice and to see his face. Elder Fitzroy uh, Donalds, uh, elder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Lances River, there in the parish of Hanover. Welcome, uh, Elder. And the poor you always have with you. No. The dean, <laughs> we have to my right, um, um, Elder Kings the Clerk. We call him the dean. Uh, welcome, Elder, uh, to and these are the the voices and the minds that the Lord has really anointed this afternoon. It's not about us. It's not about self. It's all about God. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, every afternoon we minister. Um, to you, as usual, I have the privilege on, behalf, on your behalf to ask uh, them some questions as we dig deep into the word of the Lord. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Father, you know our hearts. You know that we seek now truly the anointing of your Holy Spirit to guide us and to use us. And for those who are in-house and those who are online, let your Holy Spirit now saturate our, our minds and our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And Pastor Dyer, we pick up from verse 18 of Romans chapter 8. And I come to you with the very first question. Um, we, we are as God's children. And, and, and remember we said that being joint ears with Jesus um, says that whatever belongs to Jesus belongs to us. But we also, as I remember Pastor Rahim mentioned it, that being joint ears with Jesus says that we have to go through, face sheer also in the sufferings of Jesus. We will have to go to trials and difficulties as Jesus did. So we can't welcome the joy and shun the sorrow. 
But there is, Pastor Dyer, there is good news for us that as God's children, we can endure hardship. Why, therefore, then, Pastor Dyer, are hardship and trials endurable for the justified believer in Jesus Christ? Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Beyond the Surface family. It has been a while. You know, I, I, I had the opportunity at the Donald Center to join in a few moments of the afternoons to watch what was happening. Uh, but it is good to be sharing with my brothers here again in the study of the word. It's always good to share in the study of the word. Uh, but just so my friends will understand that uh, sometimes it's not because I don't want to be here, Pastor, yeah, but I responsibilities know. take us different parts of the, of the field. Uh, but it's really good to be back with you. Now, now the text in Romans 8, uh, verse 18 says, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed wow. in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. So, so Paul, is, Paul is looking at the reality that the sufferings are temporal, but glory will be eternal. As a result, one can bear the sufferings because it's for a time, but the glory will be for eternity. Now, now Paul himself could speak of these from much painful experiences. He has been shipwrecked. He has been beaten. He has, he has gone through all kinds of suffering. He's been imprisoned. Paul has been faced with cannibals. You name it, Paul has experienced it in terms of suffering for the gospel's sake. And, and, and at the time he was writing, he had already been through so much suffering and was being prepared for more suffering. And so Paul, Paul understood what it meant to end your suffering as a child of God. The Christian regards the trials and sorrows of this life as minute compared to the joy and ultimate deliverance from a world of sin. Understanding that all the suffering of this life shall one day come to an end. But when we shall be glorified, there will be no ending to it. Then the, the, the endurance of the suffering becomes tolerable. Understanding also that we do not bear it alone. But we have one who stands with us through the sufferings of this life. Makes it endurable. So the suffering may seem great. But they are in the light compared with the eternal weight of glory, as Peter calls it. The eternal weight of glory, which the afflictions are working out for us. They are for only a moment, but the glory is eternal. And so though the sufferings will soon pass away, we shall be glorified forever. So the revelation of the sons of God will be the public manifestation of the entire work of redeeming grace in all its fullness when Jesus Christ shall come back to claim us as his own when we shall hear well done good and faithful you've been faithful in a few things you've endured the sufferings of this life but enter now the joys of thy Lord this is a hope that gives a child of God the resilience needed, the tenacity needed through the sufferings of this life. And so Paul describes the creation as longingly awaiting this revelation when God's children shall be revealed in the likeness of Christ, having put off the man of sin and have been alive in Christ, now fully reflect of his character standing in perfection as Christ hath made us perfect the whole creation looks forward to that moment when lost humanity have lost its lostness and is now standing in the perfection which Christ hath made us one with him this my friends 
make it worthwhile to endure the sufferings of this life, which are light in comparison. And so though in the beginning God created everything good, we know that we can see the marks of the decay and death that is brought about by sins, a fury, the fury of the elements and the destructive instincts even of, of beasts around us are evidence of the vanity and aimlessness that this creation has, has been subjected to understanding that when man sinned, uh, God looked at the woman and God said to the woman, you shall feel pain. God looked at the serpent and said, your head shall be crushed. But he looked at the man and said, cursed is the earth for your sake. So the dust is cursed, which means all that comes from the dust has been recipients of the curse of Adam's fall. Hence, we are all born with the fallen nature. However, one day, one day, the perfect nature shall be restored in man and we shall live without the depravity, without the corruption that sin has brought about on all Adam's posterity. And the very elements shall be purified of sin for the earth shall melt with fervent heat as a result of the coming of the Lord and we shall find that the earth shall be made brand new and sin and sinners shall be no more. Hence, the glory that is about to be revealed includes the heavenly brightness of the second coming and the manifestation of Christ with all his divine perfection coming with the light of the glory of the Father coming with 10,000 times 10,000 angels all of this manifestation of the glory of God shall be revealed among God's people and we shall be changed from mortal to immortal. We shall be changed from corruption to incorruption. Therefore, we can bear the sufferings of this life for we know that they are temporal. But the glory of God that shall attend the children of God is eternal. I will endure whatever suffering comes because I know it shall not be forever. And what comes thereafter shall be forever. For the children of God will enjoy the liberty of the glory. The freedom of the glory of God. The complete freedom brought about by the presence of the illimitable one. We shall enjoy freedom from the power of sin, freedom from temptation, freedom from calamities, freedom from death. And so why not endure the sufferings that are temporal, understanding that the joys of the Lord shall be eternal. I too, like Paul, would join in saying, I'll endure the sufferings of this life now because I know what is coming shall be eternal. Wow, thank you very much. I, 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 do, I think it is too early for me to say tremendous. No, but if it is tremendous, it is tremendous. And, 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 and you know, friends, that the sufferings that we are going through, Paul is emphasizing that what we need to do is to keep our minds fixed, Pastor Dyer, and what is to come. Because better things are coming and it worth it worth for us to endure the sufferings. You know, Ellen White says that if 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 God should open our eyes and give us a glimpse of what heaven is like, listen to me, we would never be content with earth. We will never probably sin again. And that's why when Stephen was being was stoned, being stoned. God open heaven and, and give him a glimpse. Listen to me, man. You could have thrown the biggest rock past Stephen. He no feel it anymore because he has seen the glory that yeah. is to come. So even if you cut off his hand and his foot, him not, because he has seen what is to come. Now, as you read further on in Romans, uh, this is sweet, friends. As you read further on in Romans 8, you see that there are three groanings. Three groanings. The creation groans. The, the saints, the believers groan. And the Holy Spirit 
groans. Now, I'm going to ask you, Elder Clark, to, uh, and, 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 and Elder now, Donald Slew, you, you speak on the other. Uh, there are two groanings, the first two groanings, the groaning of creation and the groaning of the, the, the believers. What does it mean for the whole creation and those who have been born and new by the Holy Spirit to groan? Okay, thank you, Pastor, and uh, evening, everyone. All right, so we're looking at the groanings uh, mentioned by Paul here in the book of Romans. I want to suggest that to understand verse 22, which speaks of the whole creation groaneth, that it probably starts at verse 19, something, some of it covered by Pastor Adiah. Um, in verse 19, so I want to start there firstly. In verse 19, it gives an overview uh, of what Paul wants to bring out. So in verse 19, Paul says, for the earnest expectation of the creature or creation, some translation would use creation, uh, waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. And so that introduces what Paul is about to speak about. He's saying that the whole creation is anticipating, is waiting for the time when God will manifest the sons of God ultimately. No doubt we know that we'll be at his second coming. So he's saying that there is a great expectation that the creation has. Not only, he's not, he's not talking just about human beings. He's talking about actually everything. He is, he is now, um, uh, you know, personifying is the word I want. He's now personifying all of God's creation, as it were, to help us to understand how great this expectation is. And then he breaks it down. So in verse 20, he talks about the creation, how it was subject to vanity or the bondage that it is under. So he looks at the past and he realizes, he said, hey, God's creation suffered from the time Adam sinned, right? It suffered. It is now under that bondage, not willingly, but it did. And then in verse 21, he looks to the future. So he went to the past about God's creation, um, how it went under the bondage. Then he goes to the future in verse 21, and he says that the creation also shall be delivered from the bondage. So now he first tells you how the creation went under bondage at the beginning, but he says, hey, there is a future when the creation itself shall be freed from that bondage. And then Paul looks at the creation now which is where we are when he uses the term groaning. So he first tells you how the creation suffered and that the creation has hope. When the sons of God will be made manifest, it has hope that it will be relieved from that bondage. So what about now? How is God's creation um, you know, dealing with that now? That's verse 22. For we know, he says, that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. So he says that the creation is groaning. Now, now that sounds bad, but when you understand uh, the, the, the Greek word behind it and what it means, you'll realize that it is all not that bad. It's, it's, it's more hopeful and joyous. So he says, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. What is that travailing? Uh, and groaning that he's talking about. He's talking about birth pangs. This is when uh, a woman who is pregnant is having, you know, those pangs, those pain, telling her that it is about time for the child to come. So that woman, even though she's suffering, as it were, yet she's looking forward with joy to the birth of her son, of her child, of her daughter. So that's the kind of birth pangs that he's talking about, that the old creation is anticipating. Yes, it's suffering, all right? So we'll find Paul going through the present suffering to the future joy. It's a theme that runs through to the end of this chapter, actually. So he's saying, hey, yes, she is suffering. All creation. And right now he's not talking about us yet because he's going to talk about us after. So he's talking about all great God's creation except the sons of God. He says all God's creation looking forward to the time when they will be relieved from the bondage and the suffering as it were. Even now uh, suffering under the birth pangs but with anticipation. They are looking forward to the time when all of that is going to end. 
And then he explains it a little bit more now with the second groaning in verse uh, 23. And not only they, so not only God's creation, not including the sons of God yet because he's going to speak about them now. So not only are they looking at the animals maybe, he's personifying everything now, looking at the, the trees and everything that is suffering from, from sin because sin is in the world. Everybody is groaning. Everything is groaning and longing and waiting for the time when it will be over. And he says, but not only they are longing for it, but we also, that's in verse 23 now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. I'm telling you that that is hopeful. I'm telling you that that is joyful. So hear what Paul is saying. Paul says, even we who have the first fruits of the Spirit. So if we, what, what, what is he talking about, the first fruits of the Spirit? Now, some individuals may say the first fruits, plural, of the Spirit may refer to the gifts of the Spirit that God has given to the church initially to empower the church to do the work of God. The church got a taste of God's power, got a taste of God's glory. Jesus did say that you should wait for me at Jerusalem and then the power of God shall be revealed. So the church got a taste of the power of God, the first fruits of God. And when I get a taste of that, you want more. All right? So he's saying that the church, we who have gotten a first taste of that, we look forward to a greater manifestation of God's power when this mortal shall put on immortality, when the temporal, as Pastor Dyer says, will become the permanent, as it were. We are looking forward because we got a taste of it. He says, even we are groaning, even we are having birth pangs. It is telling us that something is about to happen. The floodgates are about to open. <laughs> the contractions are more... Yeah, I uh, want to be careful on uh, yeah, those yes, things, yeah. not being a doctor. You know. <laughs> but they, 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 as, as they're getting closer <laughs> yeah, to birth, the more con frequent contractions. Yeah. By the way, that's what Jesus said in yes, Matthew 24. Yes. When you see all these things happening, they yeah. are the birth pangs. Yes. Know, know that I'm about to come, as it were. And so the first fruit may represent that. But, but the first fruits of the Spirit may also mean the gift of the Spirit himself. That God has given us elsewhere, the Bible says, that the, the, the gift of the Spirit is like a deposit. All right? All right. It is the deposit to let us know that something bigger is going to come. Something greater is on its way. So, so we have the first gift of the Holy Spirit. We, we have also the gifts that the Holy Spirit gave. And all of that, as it were, is just chiming within us for great anticipation of something greater. And that's the birth pangs that he's talking about. We are groaning. We are groaning. Yes, we are feeling pain, but, but, but we are bearing it patiently because something great is about to happen. And then he, he summarizes it somewhat. He, he concludes it somewhat. He says, for we are saved. By the way, I should tell you, it says that we are waiting for the adoption. All right. The adoption? But then Paul says or earlier, we looked at it last we week, that yeah. we are adopted. So how is he saying we are looking forward to the adoption to with the redemption of our bodies? What is Paul talking about? Well, you see, beloved, that the process of the adoption began, but we haven't yet realized every, everything about the adoption. We haven't yet gotten the kingdom of God, the physical kingdom of God. We have not changed from mortal to immortality. We have not yet become fully joint hearers. Yes, the name is on the deed and we are there, but we haven't realized it. So Paul is saying that we are looking forward to that. So we are groaning in the pain. Mm, yeah. But, but, but we are bearing it. You know what groan means? You are bearing the pain, by the way. So he's bearing, we are bearing the pain because we know that something great is about to happen. And he said, hey, the truth is it hasn't happened yet because it's something that we are hoping for. <laughs> we are hoping for it. And if we had it, we would not be hoping for it. But if we have that hope that it will happen, then we are going to wait patiently. That is why every Christian has to be patient. Here is the patience of the saints. James says that the trying of the faith of our faith worketh patience, right? So we must have endurance, as it were, patience and, and endurance waiting for the Lord. And he says that we are looking for this hope. We are groaning, we are having the pains, but it's only for a time. 
It is only for a time. We are looking forward to the glorious day when Jesus Christ can change this vile body. And to wit, we will have the redemption of our body in him. Amen. Praise the Lord. And, and, and you know, uh, um, Elder Donaldson, uh, I come to, we come to one of my favorite aspects now of the Christian life. And recently, I have been doing some serious study and meditation. Because the truth of the matter is, we have probably the greatest um, blessing and access to God that is not used as it ought to. And that is prayer. That is prayer. Friends, if we know how to pray and to use the power of prayer, God would have answered many more of our prayers. There is a direct... Because... When we pray, we should not only pray for our um, challenges that we are facing and our trials. We should pray that we get to know God better. Hey, if we go to church, the devil doesn't tremble. When we read, when we sing, the devil doesn't necessarily tremble. But when we get down on our knees... That is the time the devil trembles. And so I ask you now, as we go to the third groan, groaning, what does it mean for the Holy Spirit? And he said the Holy Spirit groans. What does it mean for the Holy Spirit to make intercession for us with groanings? And how does the Holy Spirit assist us in expressing our longings to God? Good afternoon, mm. online family and those in-house. I'm happy you started that way because Pastor Day and Elder Clark have put us on a path that is amazing. And now we can understand in context why the theme of these 13 verses from verse 18 to 30 speak to from suffering to glory. It is said, you know, when we know how to pray, we know what to say. When we know how to pray, we know what to say. Let's look at the two verses that we are speaking about now. Verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what to say. How to pray. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered, cannot be expressed, deep, passionate. Verse 27. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now given the fact that we do not know how to pray and we do not know what to say, it is important for the Holy Spirit to do something for us. If we go about, Jesus Christ gave us a perfect example, you know. When he was going through the suffering and humanity seemed to be so dominant there, he said, Father, let this cup pass from me, not my will. Because in his emotion and deep groaning that can't be so openly expressed, he knew that if his will was not aligned to God's will, then God's will must supersede. And so he said, not my will, but God's will. And so, friends, when we pray many times, have we not know what, known what to say? The Holy Spirit ensures that God's will takes control. And so the Holy Spirit aligns our will with God's will. So that the suffering that we are going through will lead us to glory. As, as Pastor said, it's temporal, the suffering. 
But the eternal weight in glory is amazing. So the Holy Spirit himself suffers with his people as eagerly he looks for the day of the ultimate deliverance. And that is why pastors and elders, when we go through these sufferings, they seem to be light moment. Because guess what? We are seeing beyond right now. We are seeing the glory, the amazement, the awesomeness of the sweetness of what is before us. Only God knows the end from the beginning. And that is why, my friends, in our prayers, we should always express our complete submission to God's will. Complete submission to God's will. Christ, now this is important for us to understand as we speak of the Holy Spirit. Christ, our mediator, and the Holy Spirit are constantly interceding for humanity. But the Spirit pleads not for us as Christ does. What the Spirit does, it works upon our hearts. Join out our prayers and penitence and praise and thanksgiving. And this is something we must understand because prayer is deep. You know, I remember something when Jesus had some issue with his disciples not being able to cast out that demon. Yes. He said to them, when they, when they asked him, one away, Master, why couldn't we? No, I'm happy that he didn't say, why didn't we? Mm -hmm. Because it didn't mean you could have, but didn't. But couldn't we means, listen, the capacity should have been there. You would have been so enabled. Why couldn't we? And Jesus said, listen, understand this. This thing commit, but by prayer and fasting. Mm -hmm. Pastor, when we know how to pray and when we know what to say, we are so enabled, so awesome it is. So amazing it is that we, in Christ, we can be more than conquerors. Know this. The gratitude which flows from our lips is the result of the Spirit striking the right chords, hey. touching the right keys, playing the right music. So guess what? The music of the heart can sing to the rhythm of the right beat. Amazing. Yeah. God knows the desire the Holy Spirit inspires in our hearts. He does not need to have these deep emotions expressing words because truly God who knows everything and understands everything doesn't need eloquence. He doesn't need a pharisaical kind of prayer. He needs a publican's prayer. Lord have mercy on me. That is passionate. That comes with compassion. And, 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 and what we also must understand that the second part of which I, I read in verse 27 this verse offers two reasons combined in one. First, the Spirit intercedes in accordance with God's own will and purpose. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things. And you can look at 1 Corinthians 2 verse 10. Secondly, the Spirit's intercession is for saints, and saints are special to God. Have a divine purpose. Mm -hmm. And when I say all these things, my pastors, I sum it up in this very short capsule. And so I want everyone who watch and listen to take these capsules. Good for your soul. This is what it says. The Spirit helps believers know how to pray. The Spirit articulates those prayer burdens that people cannot even express. The Spirit's intercession can be trusted. Let me reiterate. The Spirit's intercession can be trusted because he intercedes according to God's will. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Tremendous, tremendous, tremendous. Listen to me. Call your friends. Call your neighbors. You can't miss this beyond the surface. And, and, and you see, Elder Donaldson, so we say the creation groans. The, 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 the believers, the saints are groaning. And the Holy Spirit, no. It, the, the groaning is for what to, the completion of, of the glory of God. What has, been, what has started. So the creation but, but, and, and, and the believers. But if the Holy Spirit, who is from eternity... Who knows what glory is all. This is what gets them in. Who knows what glory is all about. If the Holy Spirit, Pastor Daya, groans for us because he knows what the future and the glory is all about, then I must hold on. I must hold on. I must keep faithful. And also, friends, our prayers should not only just 
present our trials to the Lord. Our prayers is to get to know God better. To know his character. To know his beauty. To know his glory. It, our prayers should cause us to, to contemplate the sacrifice of Jesus on Calvary's cross. For God to open our minds to see his suffering. Let, 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 let me go to Pastor Dyer. Let me, let me go to Pastor Dyer. Because there is a passage. Probably this is the verse, Pastor Dyer, that has been quoted in, in Romans 8 more than probably any other verse. And, and by the way, the people online said, Pastor Dyer, you come back with great fire. <laughs> I will tell you what I told them offset. Um, what did Paul mean when he said, that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. Thank you so much. Romans 8.28. And you're right. This text is probably the most loved and known text in the chapter of Romans. Yet it is also often misunderstood. No, no, no. But, but Paul, Paul is adding another premise for confidence in the future. Paul is saying that according to the knowledge that we have, God works his purposes through the free will of human beings, but he works them for the good of his children. And so according to the eternal purpose of God, all things contribute to the welfare of those who love God. Even the troubles and the sufferings of this life, uh, instead of hindering our salvation, many times help it to press forward. And so at every step, the child of God should understand we are in the hands of a loving father who are carrying out his divine purposes through our lives. It will not always be comfortable, but we can always appreciate that God has our best interest at heart. And when he has our best interest at heart, even though we might suffer along the journey, it will work out in our favor. And you know, Joseph is a classic example. And, and in Psalm 105, speaking about Joseph, David says, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters, he was laid up in irons until the time that... His word came. The word of the Lord tried him. The king sent and loosed him. Even the ruler of the people and let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his substance. And so we find that Joseph went from being a chosen loved son to a condemned criminal to a ruler of a nation. God sometimes brings us through a valley for us to reach the mountain top of our experience with him. It will not always be a plain or a plateau, but God wants to take us to the mountain top of our experience with him. And that means going through the valley of suffering sometimes. Therefore, we recognize that even though we might go through the valley of suffering, it is still working for the good of God's people to get us to the mountaintop experience with Christ. And so Christian believers also get sick and sometimes die. And all the martyrs that have gone on before, all the martyrs, they lived and they died with that hope that the sufferings they endure Though they might not, uh, though it might bring their demise in this life, yet it is not the end because after death in this life comes eternal life when we shall one day live with Christ. And so we find that Stephen was stoned, Paul was beheaded, Peter was crucified upside down, John was thrown into a cauldron of boiling oil, and yet he was pulled out unharmed. And and if we look at it, 
All these, all these went through their suffering, trusting in Christ. And the history of the Christian church is full of stories about the intense suffering of God's people. In every age, we see Christians who have endured persecution in one form or another. Yet, we realize that all of it works for the good of God's children, it is said that the blood of the martyrs became the watering of the seeds of the, of, of the Christian church. And so the, the Christian church was watered with the blood of the martyrs, hence it grew from strength to strength. Now we are standing on the shoulders of those who went on before nothing Brothers and sisters, can touch a child of God without the permission of our Heavenly Father. Nothing can truly harm God's people without Jesus permitting it. And so, though we may, we may suffer in this life, we will find that it will not be the demise of the, the faith of God's people because we hold on to more than what is here and now. We have something greater to look forward to. And so, all things are permitted to work together for good. To those who love God. If God permits suffering, if God permits perplexities, if God permits the vicissitudes of life, they are to help us to achieve the eternal weight of glory. If God allows it, it's for it's going to work out for our good. We can put our trust in him because we know that he has our best interest at heart. God loves us with an everlasting love. I told the folks in church today that God is recklessly, he is selflessly, he is eternally in love with us. And as a result, we can trust the purposes of God for our life. At the end of his life, Joseph was able to say to his brothers, you thought evil against me, but God meant it for good. Sometimes in the midst of the suffering, we cannot see how it will work out for our good, but we've got to learn to trust the purposes of God. And you who are watching might be going through a moment of suffering now. Maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe you're faced with cancer. Maybe you have been abused. Maybe you've gone through some tumultuous family situations. Whatever you're suffering, God wants you to know why in the midst of it, it might feel unbearable. It shall work for your good because you have put God first in your life. It's going to work out for your good. You've just got to hold on a little longer. Have faith and trust in his unfailing love. For the call of God is to produce the intended effect of the purposes of God. We realize that it is God's eternal purpose to save sinners by grace. And since it is the purpose of him who work all things after the counsel of his own will, says Paul in Ephesians 1 verse 1. Uh, it, it follows that all things must therefore work together for good to the called according to that purpose that God is working out. And so Paul fully recognizes that yes, we have freedom of choice. But, and God is not removing the freedom of choice. But he is working it for our good through the choices that we freely make. He's accounting for his purposes in our lives. But behind it all, behind everything that transpires, the sovereignty and the purposes of a loving God is being worked out. Therefore, there is no contradiction mm -hmm. between the free will of humanity and the purposes of God. God works his purposes through the choices we freely make. And for God's purpose to save man is, is realized through the proper exercise of man's freedom. We then must acknowledge God's will in our lives and know that once it is happening in our life, once it is happening in the life of the child of God, mm -hmm. it is going to work for the good of the child of God because you are in the hands of an ever-loving father who faileth not. Amen, amen. I am trying my best 
to 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 keep my composure. But I re I have to say tremendous. I don't know if I can keep my seat for uh, for much longer without getting up and shouting. But all things are not necessarily good. But they work according to God's purpose. All things are good. Don't move a muscle. Because we are getting deeper. We are getting deeper. We go now to a musical item. And then we get back. and Continue our study. No condemnation.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a hallelujah afternoon it is this afternoon. Thank you very much for that song. What a day that's going to be when we hear. These are they who have come out of great tribulation and have washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. Hold on, friend. Hold on, sister. Hold on, brother. The trials of this life cannot be compared with the glory that we shall receive. Uh, welcome back to the uh, second aspect of Beyond the Surface as we continue to look at Romans chapter 8, part 2, no condemnation. And uh, we were just reminded that all things may not be good, but all things work together for good to those who are called after the purpose of God. Elder Donaldson said we should pray that God's will will be done. And if we do that, then all things work together. When God works his will, it is for our good, Pastor Diab. Um, but, but Elder Clark, we come to probably one of the most troublesome aspects of chapter 8 that has scholars scholarizing and discussing. Now we come to verses 29 and 30. Talk about predestination. In what sense does God predetermine events in the lives of those who are saved by his grace? <laughs> All right. Thank you again, Pastor. Uh, yes, it's, it, it's one of those, uh, one would say, difficult texts. At least there are various interpretations to it. Um, but there's only one right interpretation, all right? So, so what we need to do is to look carefully at the text. So we are at Romans chapter 8. I'm going to read verses 29 and 30 together, and then I'll quickly see how, how we can summarize what, what Paul is saying. We should never divorce verse 29 and 30 from verse 28. It's in line with verse 28, all right? So in verse 29, Paul says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Verse 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, there are individuals who read these two verses, and they therefore suggest that, that God, probably arbitrarily or not, predestined individuals to be saved or to be lost. And by that they mean that against the person's will, it doesn't matter what the person does, if God already sets it, that God sets it from the beginning, and there's no way the person can turn. God predestined it, and so it must happen. Paul did speak about predestination, but did he speak of it in that context? That God basically goes against the free will of individual, and God decides, probably arbitrarily or otherwise, who should be saved and who should not be saved just by his own decision? Uh, that's what we are looking at today. So let's look carefully at the text. The Bible, it began by saying, for whom, and he here represents God, all right? For whom God did foreknow, he also did predestinate, all right? So, so that predestination is not based on God's arbitrary decision. It is based on God's foreknowledge. In other words, God knew and he sees what will happen? Who will make the decision? And so God has a right to tell you that such and such is going to happen because he already knows it. Let, let, us, let us look at it a little bit more. For whom he did foreknow. Who is, the, who, who is Paul talking about here? For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine. 
These are the individuals he spoke about in verse 28. Because Paul is referring to those who love God, right? To them that love God and those who are called. So he's talking about those who love God. So Paul says, for whom he did foreknow, and I'll just attach this so that it makes a little sense for the point I'm making. For whom he did foreknow would love God. All right? So God already knows the end from the beginning. Our God is an omniscient God. He knows what I will do the next five years, the next ten years. And God knows it as much as he knows the past. Everything to God is just like the same because of God's perfection and God's omniscience and God's power. Look at what the Bible says. We look at a few texts that speaks of God's foreknowledge. In Hebrews 1 verse 4, the Bible says, All things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him whom we have with whom we have to do everything is open before god in isaiah a text that we regularly quote when we are dealing with prophecy god says declaring the end from the beginning all right and he says that he tells us of things that are yet to happen before it happens because he foreknows it and then in acts 15 verse 18 the bible speaks of uh uh uh, the apostle speaking that things are known unto God are all his works from the very beginning. The past, the present, and the future are all equally known to God. So let us remember this, that God's predestination is based on God's foreknowledge. God's foreknowledge is that God sees the decision that the person have made even before he made it. God didn't make the person make the decision. The person freely makes a decision. Let's look at a, free, a few texts again that emphasizes that God does not take away the free will. John 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that whomsoever believeth in him should not what? Perish but have everlasting life. What does the text say? Whosoever. All right whomsoever. It depends on the individual. Yes, the Bible tells us about God's will. God said, as I live, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. That's his will. That's what God would like. In other words, God would have predestined that if God's predestination was based on God's will. He wishes, he wills, he wants it to happen, but it doesn't happen. Why? Because men have a choice. The power of choice. So even it is my will to save all of you, all of you may not be saved because some of you may decide not to accept me. All right? So that is what the Bible is saying. So the Bible tells us that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to him in repentance. That is what is desires. But God still allows the free will of man. God allows the free will of man. In 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4, the Bible says, For God will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. That's what God wants. That really is God's will. But it will, will it happen? No. Because love, love, as it were, allows the freedom of the loved to take place. God wants us to freely make the decision. So the foreknowledge of God is based on the decision that we make. The decision that I make, that I love God, right? And so Paul is encouraging the believers in Romans chapter 8, 28 onwards. He is saying, you don't have to worry about the bad things you see happening to you now, right? If you love God, if you're going to persevere with God, you're going to remain in the faith. Don't you worry about that because the glory at the end of the road is sure. Because it God predestined that end. The end is predestined. If you love God, this is what is going to happen to you. Those who love God will be saved. In fact, in, fact, in explaining predestination, um, it is important for us to understand that if it's anything God truly predestinate in terms of what he does at the very beginning, are two things. One is what Paul says, God predestined that whoever love him that they should be fashioned into the image of his son. All right? So those who love God, God sets it that once you love him, this is what needs to happen. You need to become like my son. How are you going to become like my son? By the Holy Spirit. All right? 
So you're going to become like my son. So that, that is something God sets. If you accept me, this is what will happen through the Holy Spirit. Two is the end, the consequence of the decision. So if you, so what is, what is predestined is that those who reject God will not be saved. Those who accept the Lord will be saved. All right? But notice that is who does these things. That part is based on the human free will as it were. So God's predestination uh, uh, that Paul is speaking about here is based on God's foreknowledge. It is not an arbitrary decision by God. It is not even by the will of God. Who God would like to be saved and who God would not like to be saved. God would like everybody to be saved. All right, But only those who make the decision will be saved. So let's just finish up on the text. So Paul says here that God has so predestined that these people should be conformed. So God did not predestine somebody here to go to hell or heaven. Right? It, it, no, no matter what decision they make. What he predestined is that those who love God would be conformed to the image of his son. So that his son might have preeminence. Because if you're going to conform to the son, the son would have to be before you and higher than you for you to want to be like the son. So he's saying that Jesus Christ is, has preeminence over everyone. Then in verse 30, which is the troublesome part of the text for some. Moreover, whom he did predestine, them he also called, whom he called, them he also justified, whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now that would sound as if it is God who, who, who calls only those who he thinks will be saved and so forth. But when you look at it, that's not what God is saying. Do not forget the first premise, for whom he predestined. But who does he predestine? Those who in his foreknowledge he sees will use their freedom of choice to accept him. So you can't take predestined in this text by itself. You have to take it with verse 29, that it is based on those who use their free will to love God, as it were. So he's saying that those who love God, those who have accepted the Lord, God ensures that the process of salvation for that soul, each step, is accomplished. And what is the step? He says the step is we are called. Right? God call all by the way. All right? But only those who accept that call and, and willingly allow his Holy Spirit to work in their lives will be saved. So he said he called. And then what does he do? Justified. And in that justification, we have sanctification. Because immediately after justification, sanctification comes. So he's saying that the steps are assured for those who love God, the steps of your salvation are assured. God have the steps set from long time. Once you accept him, you are going to be justified. And you are going to be sanctified. And then you are going to be glorified. That is why we know that all things will work together for good to those who love God. Because all those stages are set and in the end... Our suffering today will be light compared to the heavy weight glory that we are going to have in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Wow, that was deep. And, 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 and you know the thing to Ella Clark is that God's foreknowledge, and, and, and I appreciate this about God's foreknowledge, the thing does not happen because God saw it. It is the other way around. It is because it will happen that God knows his foreknowledge saw that it was going to happen. So it's not because God saw that it, 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 God's foreknowledge does not affect man's action or man's choice. God knew about it because he, he sees that it's going to happen in the, in, in the future. And that's, but, but the whole matter, and which I appreciate, that this is a guarantee for every step of salvation process. Elder Donaldson, uh, I, I come to you now. And you know, as we go through our trials and difficulties, because even Jesus, while he was on the cross, said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Sin even caused Jesus to feel 
separated from his father. How do we know that God is for and not opposed to us in our trials? Beautiful question. You know, God's children believes that trials, temptation, hardship, difficulties are skewed against us. And the mere fact that it's skewed against us, then God is against us. But the text itself says that God is for us. The operative word is for. Because he who is for you stands up with you, is there during your difficulties. And we are accepted in Christ. So go to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 18. Let me read this. It says, For in that he himself had suffering, had suffered, being tempted, is able to do what? Succor them that are tempted. So in our trials, in our difficulties, in our persecution, he is there for us, is there with us. Because if God was willing to give up his son for us, why would he be against us? And that is critical for us to understand. So if you look at the brethren, the one who is against us is really the devil, the accuser, right? But God who is loving, who is amazing, right? And is willing to accept his infinite son and we are accepted in his son, then he is always for us. There is no uncertainty, my friends, about God's love and support for his children. And Paul has already, has already showed it. He said, God regards us as his sons and has sent his spirit to help us for this purpose to save us. Look again. It is encouraging, therefore, for us to recognize that since God has purpose and is actively engaged in accomplishing salvation for believers, all our enemies are also his enemies. You remember what he had said to Abraham? I bless those who what? And curse those who? So those who curse you are against you. Those who bless you are for you. God is for us. The same God who did not spare his son in everything besides is, 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 is touching to understand that he is with us through everything that we do. And one of the things that we emphasize before is that when God's children know God, we know what to pray for. So if we know God, we would not pray and say, God, why am I suffering? Because he promised that in our suffering, it means he knew before that we will suffer. But I'll be there for you, with you. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. It's for us, right? The greatest of all gifts is the strongest proof that God is for us. And Elder Clark says it, John 3, 16. For, the word comes back, for God so loved the world that he gave. It is his love, why he gave his love for us. Therefore, he's not willing for us to perish. He's not willing for us to struggle deeply, but that God will bring us to acknowledge that he is for us. The Christian, therefore, could ask for no greater ground for confidence and patience and endurance because God is for us. So surely, brothers and sisters, then no matter what the trials, no matter what will come upon us, we should never doubt God. You know what Satan does as an accuser? He himself being the serpent. And when we speak of him being the serpent, and the lesson points out to us, we are speaking as a serpent meaning a deceiver. He, the deceiver, deceives us and creates doubt within humans, humanity's mind to say God is against us. And once we are lured into that doubt, he put on his dragon coat to destroy who he has deceived. He is against us. But God stands for us, is there for us. So we can feel unworthy when these come, come, temptation come upon us, brothers and sisters. But we must understand that God is willing through Christ to make us worthy. He is for us. When he gave himself in Christ for the sin of the world, he undertook the case of every soul. He then spared at his own son because of his love for humanity. So I say, in these two verses, 31 and 32, it speaks profoundly to God's everlasting love for humanity. 
And that's the theme of verse 31 to verse 39. Mm -hmm. Everlasting means he is there with us through thick and through thin, no matter what. The circumstances in our lives will change, but God is still there. He's consistent and he's constant. Right? He, he, his love is so great that it is protector and defender. And only someone who is for us will be our protector and defender. And verse 32, as I ends, it says, God's love is limitless. So the limitlessness of his love is what has gifted us eternal life. And God's love knows no bound. Where is the love? And, and you see how God, you see how Paul argues from the, the greater to the lesser. If God spare not his son, but he gave his son, then why wouldn't he be with us in our suffering and in our trials? Having made that ultimate sacrifice. Had he, having made that ultimate sacrifice. sacrifice that he has made. We're coming down now to the, the, the final leg. And, 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 and Pastor Diam, I ask you, how does God answer the charges brought against his chosen people? The elder Donald said the devil is the accuser. He is the great accuser, my pastor. He is the great accuser. And so what the devil does, he, he flaunts our imperfections in the face of the father, indicating that we all shall become fodder for the flames. Mm -hmm. He's flaunting our failures and he reminds the father that the wages of sin is death and he takes our sins and places them on the notice board of the universe a statement that christ is a failure in his bid to be our savior and when when the, when, the, when the righteous angels look on and ask him what are these and where are they displayed he points to first corinthians 6 verse 9 and 10 know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God be not deceived neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers nor effeminate nor abuse of themselves with mankind nor thieves nor covetous nor drunkards nor revelers nor extortioners none of these shall inherit the kingdom of God so he says see all of these are are destined for death. They are deserving of death because they are all mine and they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the angels say, read on. And when you look down in verse 11, it says, and such were some of you, but you are washed by his grace. You are sanctified by his grace. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of of our God. They are no longer yours. They are no trophies of his grace. The devil says, how can this be? And the angel says, well, didn't you read John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever the idolater and the adulterer, whosoever the effeminate, whosoever the thief, whosoever believes in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. For Jesus Christ came to earth to save lost humanity. And the devil says, well, I defeated him at the cross. I nailed him to the cross. I watched him die. I buried him in that tomb. I won the victory. And the angel says, well... You did crucify him, yes. He was buried, yes. He was nailed to a cross, but you did not defeat him for what you thought was his defeat was actually his greatest act of victory. For it is written as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up that whoso believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. They could not have eternal life without his blood being shed. His blood now pays the price and have ransomed them from the grave. Hence, they now have a hope of life eternal. In spite of what you've dragged them through, they now have a hope of life eternal. And so, yes, the charges have been brought against God's people. But we know that if God be for us, then who can be against us? So God's elect 
need not fear the accuser. It is God himself, the judge of all, who has pronounced them upright according to his plan of justification. I see, to justify it is the opposite of to lay a charge against them. So God says, hey, yes, I know they are imperfect. I know what they have done. I have seen their mess, but I have paid their price, and so now they can be free. Herewith, we can rejoice in the freedom that Jesus Christ hath made us free. We do not worship a dead Christ, but Jesus Christ, though he died, he came back from the grave to let us know that even though we live with him and may die with him, we shall one day rise with him to walk in newness of life, never to die again. He died the eternal death so we can live the eternal life that is his. And so Christ, being our intercessor and advocate with the Father, clearly states in Scripture that we, we, though we may die, yet shall we live through him. And so Paul wants us to understand that indeed, indeed, the devil is charging against us. The devil makes it seem like we cannot be saved. But, and let me read the text. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? The devil does. But it is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? The devil does. But it is Christ that died. Yes, Christ is risen again. Therefore, he who is even at the right hand of God also make intercession for us. Therefore, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or naked or, or peril or sword? No, nothing can separate us from the love of God, regardless of the charges laid against us, because Jesus Christ is he who hath justified us. Hence, salvation is guaranteed. Wow, wow. And I call that the great assurance. All right. The great assurance. The great assurance. Yes. Ella Clark, even as we get ready to, 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 to close, can anyone put a distance between us and Christ's love? Can anyone cause Christ to stop loving us? <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, as, you, as you ask it, pose it. I think of John chapter 3, 16 and the 17. All right? So in John chapter 16, the Bible tells us of the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever... Believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, that's the love of God. But he continues it. And he says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. Which is what pastor just read. Who is he that condemned it? Jesus could, but he didn't. Because he sent not the son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. What am I saying here? The love of God is so great and wonderful for the sinner's salvation that Paul is actually saying that the only thing you should be worrying about if there is something that can separate you from this love because the love of God puts you beyond the condemnation. The love of God guarantees your salvation. The love of God ensures that all things will work together for good to those who love the Lord. Therefore, your only concern is that. So what can really separate you from the love of God? And then he enumerated a few things there. Right? Child tribulation, right? or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sort. Now, one of the things we find is that Paul is asking a series of questions. Um, uh, Pastor went through, through them before, so I won't. But, but for each of the questions, Paul posits a response, all right? A true response to it. Now, can these things separate us from the love of God? The truth is, there are some people 
who appears to allow these things to separate them from the love of God. Persecution and famine and, 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 and nakedness and sword and poverty. And, and people use some of these things as excuses to be separated from the love of God. But the truth is, it's not the love of God that separates from them. It is these individuals who decide to do it. But Paul is actually saying that those who love God, that those who love God, will not make any of those things separate them from God. And then he quoted what the psalm said, that, that they are, that's in verse, that's in the next verse. He quoted that as it is written, for thy sake, listen to the response, can tribulation and death and famine separate us from God's love. Then Paul, part of his response says, as it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying that the believer, the sons of God, who will soon be manifested, the sons of God who will soon realize the full adoption, as it were, he is saying that they would rather die. They would rather die than to be separated. They would rather die than to allow famine to separate them. They would rather die than allow the threat of the sword to separate them from the love of God. And the truth is, even if the sword kills them, it doesn't separate them from the love of God. Because there is a better day that is coming. Even if they die through famine, the famine is not going to separate them from the love of God. Because a better day is coming when God is going to resurrect them and they'll be glorified. So even, so if they hold on and they should succumb to these persecution, they are still not separated from the love of God. Because the love of God will resurrect them. And so he says, this is what we are. We are therefore more than conquerors. Huh? So I'm not going to let famine separate me. I'd rather die first. And if I die in the famine, I am a conqueror in that death. He says, no, we are more than conquerors. He's not saying you might not die from famine. He's not saying you might not die from the sword. He's just saying that even with all these things, all things will work together for good to those who love God. And so if these things happen, we are going to be conquerors through these things. So I said, no, we are more than conquerors through him that love us. I love that. Paul didn't just say that we are conquerors. Paul said that we are more than conquerors. In other words, that we exceed the level of a conqueror, as it were. We are, we are, you know, sometimes you have some victory and there's some one nil and so forth, victory. If you're talking about football and if you're talking about a, a boxing match, you know, you sometimes have some, have, have some, you know, that is a first round knockout, as it were. You know, those are like the more than conquerors. You have done it, you have done it lavishly, as it were. But I want to add something to it, though, that when I see more than conquerors, I see a little different because I see Jesus as the conqueror. <laughs> I see Jesus as the conqueror. Uh, Jesus is the one who fights the battle for us. Uh, Pastor was saying it earlier. Jesus is the one who fights the battle for us on the cross of Calvary. He's the one who went through everything. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Jesus was the one whose sweat became, as it were, drops of blood. Jesus Christ, as it were, went through all that. He went through hell. He went through death and the grave, a grave from which there should be no resurrection. Someone says there's a second death. Jesus, as it were, is the conqueror. He rose up as a conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. That's what the Bible says. But then the Bible says that we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ, our Lord. What does that mean? If I had time, I'd probably give you an illustration that I like to give. But what it just means in a nutshell, let me give you the illustration. It's the boxer who fights in the match. And he is the, he is the Jesus. He's the conqueror. He's fighting the devil in that match. And he's having some, you know, tough rounds and you know, a fighting boxing and and so forth he's all blooded and so forth because he's going through the bruises and he's fighting and fighting in that battle and and finally maybe in round number 15 that's in the long time days round number 12 now if he goes to round, round number 12 and he and he knocks out his opponent maybe in the last minute now that boxer is a conqueror 
he's battered and he's bruised. He gets his money, a million, a hundred million dollars, as it were. He gets it. He's a conqueror. That's Jesus. He fought the battle. But Paul says that we are more than conquerors in Jesus. So how does that come in? Well, that boxer, when he gets that hundred million, he pays those who he needs to pay. He has 50 million dollars left, pastor. And then he went home. All this time, his wife was there suffering mentally as she was seeing what was happening on the television. But she was not battling. She didn't get any bruise or anything like that, as it were. And as the conqueror came to the door, that's the boxer, he opens the door. And then his wife comes with tears in her eyes and hugged him. Honey, oh, I'm so glad for you. I was worrying about you. And, and, and they're joyful. And then that boxer takes the winning prize. That $50 million that he had, and he gave that $50 million to his wife, who didn't even put a punch in that ring. He puts that $50 million in her hands. I'm going to tell you that she's more than the conqueror. <laughs> that she got the victory of the conqueror. That she, that she is joined here with the conqueror. And that's what God is saying. Christ fights the battle for us. And we become more than conquerors Whoa. through Jesus Christ. <laughs> I tell you, I, I, it, I, I'm trying to contain myself. I'm trying to stay in my seat. Uh, wow, that's tremendous. That's tremendous. Uh, but Elder Donaldson, the final question. Paul must be in, 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 in that height of, 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 of glory and praise. Paul made a conclusion, a serious conclusion. But is his conclusion saying it is impossible for the believer to be lost? Big question. And my, my, my listeners, those on YouTube, if you're on Facebook, if you're on WCCN, if you're on Bless TV, stay with me for the next few minutes. Because based on what Elder Clark just gave us, every one of us, sitting here, is more than conqueror. And Paul, with a conviction that is so premised on God's love for him, is expressing something here. Paul had a conviction that says, God, your love for me is everlasting. He had a conviction that says, I am driven by a spirit-filled life. He had a conviction that says, I, am, I have a life free from any indwelling sin. And because of that, God, your everlasting love is persuading me in such a way that death nor life can separate me. I go to 1 Corinthians 3.22. Paul says, everything is yours, God. So if I die, I die in you. And if I live, I live for you. Right? Your everlasting love binds me, cushions me. I'm getting to the answer. Not even the angels who are ministering spirits who love us and have gained our confidence. But even if they were to try to deter, deter me, I would not be deterred. Because guess what? I will hold on to your love that is binding me. But the angels won't do that. Neither principalities nor powers. So what Paul is saying, no civil ruler, no supernatural power that, that seek to exercise evil dominion can deter me. And Paul had been through many of those. But he, were, he was persuaded by God's love not to be moved. He had a sure foundation premised on God's love. He's more than a conqueror. So things present, nor things to come. And this speaks of the element of time. So things present, and in, and, and in Paul's days, he had been through trials, persecution, tribulation, affliction, but none of these things could deter him. And guess what? If even in things to come, Pastor Dyer, these things were even more adverse than what he went through in those present times. The love that God had for him and that binding conviction in his heart could not deter him either because he was persuaded. What is Paul saying? Nothing. So height nor depth, that speaks to an extent to space or distance. Couldn't. And when you compare, Pastor, Ephesians 3, 18 and 19, that speaks to God's love that goes, reaches everywhere. 
Paul is saying, no matter how deep, no matter how high, no matter how wide, God's love that reaches so far, that is so expansive and extensive, has gripped me so much that nothing can persuade me. And it in, is in, in summed up by saying, no creative being could separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. So is Paul saying that none can be lost? What is that saying? Because this, the, 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 the saying can fall. Hmm? The, 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 the believer can fall and, and, and be lost. But Paul is saying that nothing can pluck that believer out of Christ's hand. Mm. Oh, you don't understand. Mm. Because Christ's hand holds you so tight, everything is all right. You can put that on your status. So as expressed in chapter 5, Romans 5 verse 8, if while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Can you imagine, brothers and sisters, his love towards those of us who was justified by his blood? So the love of Christ is the love of God. And I know this. It's, it's important for us to understand that Paul said in John 10, 28, um, John is saying, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, speaking of the saints, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. When we are in Christ's hand, we are safe. I am yours, Lord, no matter what. And I add this little coinage, my pastors and my elder. I said, I cannot understand why this passage is so well loved. And so well appreciated. And so many of us so glued to it. Because this is a very low passage because it gives the following. One, the most awesome assurance of security in Christ is delved in that passage. Two, the greatest guarantee of security in Christ embedded in that passage. Three, a certainty that is concretized in Christ is entrenched in that passage. So therefore, brothers and sisters... Paul validated that confidence in saying this, that there's absolute security of those who are in Christ. And here oh, Paul ends it in verse 38 and 39. Just as he started, he ends the passage. There is no condemnation at all for those who love Christ and those who are in Christ. And he ends by saying, nothing will ever be able to separate us from the love of God. So when you're in Christ, nothing, no one, absolutely nothing can pluck us out of his hand. We are safe and we are secure for sure. Come back next week for more. <laughs> well, what a way to end it. We are safe and secure. Come back next week for more. Couldn't end it better. And all I can say, tremendous, tremendous. What a study. Um, this afternoon and thank you for staying with us there's no condemnation after those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but walk after the spirit of almighty God thank you for staying with us we are going to go to a musical item and then we come and close with prayer we're going to ask um, Elder Donaldson and Elder Clark to pray um, for the request that have, you have sent in, and then we close um, today's worship. A special musical item, and then we return for prayer. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention. I want to introduce to you here in this corner for the good and the right stands a champion robed in white. His height exceeds the heavens, his weight outweighs the world, his reach reaches everywhere, his age is evermore. He is higher than the highest, he is greater than the great, no one could ever take his crown.
the Lord. He's really uh, the champion of love. God is indeed our champion of love. Jesus and the Holy Spirit, they are our champions of love. And thank you very much for that appropriate um, song. We have come to the time when we will present in prayer your many many requests. Uh, as a matter of fact, someone has made a special request um, in the chat. We have pinned a number in the chat for someone you can call and you can talk to. Um, Pastor Dyer is also going to give you the, the numbers for the conference. Right. All right. Uh, and just to say, uh, you can get someone at the number pinned in the chat right now. If okay. you call now, someone will answer you at the number pinned in the chat. However, if you want to call the conference, the conference number is 618, that's 876 618 2416 or 2417. Let me say it again. That's 876 618 2416 or 2417. You can call the conference number on Monday. It's not open today. Uh, you can call the conference number on Monday. If you want to speak to someone right now, then please call the number that is pinned in the chat. We would be happy to hear from you. Thank you so much, Pastor William. All right. And we're going to ask um, Elder Clark and, Pastor and Elder Donaldson to lift the many requests that have been made in the chat to the Lord Jesus. We continue to do that and let us be reminded that the God we serve is a prayer answering God. It is now time to talk to our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father, our great and mighty God, thou who has made all things through the breath of your mouth, you speak, and it was done, commanded, and it stood fast. You to whom nothing is impossible, but as great and mighty and powerful you are, that you're a loving God. And we just want to give you thanks for your love towards us, a love that is immeasurable, that knows no bound. And that love, O oh Lord, that was demonstrated in Jesus Christ, in all that he has done for us, his death, 
and his resurrection on our behalf. A debt that we cannot even comprehend, O Lord, and through eternity will continue to be our study. But even that which we understand of it today, O Lord, we just praise you and magnify you for your goodness, for that love of God has given us a chance today. Today we know that your prayer answering God, that your ears are always ready to hear the prayers of your people and ready to answer. And so it is with this confidence in mind that we come this afternoon to present to you the request of your people. I rest my hand on the phone, Lord, as we now seek to cover the requests that have been put in the chat. So numerous that we cannot enumerate, but thou, O God, knowest all things. And even those requests that are abbreviated, you know the full story. Not only do you know what the problems are, but we are confident that thou also knows the solution. And we know that, in a sense, Jesus Christ himself is the answer and the solution to all problems. So we present to you, Lord, those who are praying because they are not feeling well or they have loved ones or friends or others who have requested prayer because they are not feeling well. We recognize you. We know that you are the great physician, O oh Lord. We know that you are the balm in Gilead. And so for those who are feeling pain, those who are troubled with cancer and other diseases that have put it in the chat, those who are in hospital, others are at home or elsewhere at this time going through their infirmities. We pray, O oh God, thou who has shown compassion through Jesus Christ when he was on earth. O oh Lord, we, we pray and know that even now that you are showing your compassion on these individuals. And we pray for their healing, O oh God, because Jesus is still the healing Jesus. We know, O oh God, that you are still the healing God. And so we pray for their healing. But even as we do so, O oh God, like Jesus, we understand that your will, we want your will to be done. Your will sometimes is for present day healing of those who are going through their suffering. And through it, your name can be magnified. And through it, that men can be drawn closer to you. But we also know that sometimes it is your will, O oh God, that it may not be so. But even so, God, help us to be able to accept what your will is, knowing that all things work together for good to those that love you. And so we pray for their salvation today as we pray for their sickness and for healing. We pray more so for their spiritual healing. We pray for those who have not yet accepted you and are suffering in sickness today that they will turn to you, O oh God, that they will see you as their redeemer, as their friend, their creator, and more so that they will see you as their redeemer. I pray, O oh God, that you'll forgive sins for those who have sins unforgiven, unconfessed. We ask that you'll cleanse such ones from all unrighteousness, O oh God, and they'll draw closer to you. There are some who walked with you, but walk no more at this time. We pray, O oh Lord, that they will be revived. We pray that they will see what they have lost and will come back to their first love. O oh God, all the requests, even those that we fail to mention, we leave into your care with the confidence, knowing, O oh God, that you will do what is best. Help us to understand and to leave it into your care. And whatever you do, that we will accept it, O oh God. And to praise and magnify you for your goodness. For what we can't understand now, by and by, we will understand. And we will praise you for it. Thank you for hearing and answering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Gracious Father, we are here this afternoon. We know who you are. And we know who belongs to you in the context of those who are believers in your word and call your children. As we sit here, O oh God, we lift up everyone before you. 
we look through the chat and we see the numerous issues facing your children. And we're happy, God, that they recognize that you have the answers to all the questions. You have the solutions to all the problems. And those, God, who have physical ailments recognize you as the great physician, the doctor of all doctors, who do not need just to have an x-ray because you know already what the situations are and you know exactly how to find the solution and give the answers and the remedies, oh God, for this situation. For those who have social issues, God, you are the social worker of our social workers. And you know exactly, oh Lord, to bring back that husband who is straying to the wife who is waiting. To bring back that wife to that husband who wants to reacquaint himself in a beautiful, godly relationship with his family. You have seen the burden on Myrtle's heart. Who has listed so many names who are having issues. Baby struggling, mom struggling, brother struggling, sister struggling. But they know, God, that you can succor these individuals. You can bring comfort to their lives and to their hearts. Do so for them. God, they recognize you that with their sin issues, that you are the great balm in Gilead. And you can rescue those who are languishing, those who are perishing. Do so for them, God. As with Elder Clark stated, cover these in the chat. And God, those who might be exposed, don't give them any third-party insurance, but comprehensive insurance package. That they will not be vulnerable. Speak to everyone, oh God. And as we ask you to be there for them, be there for those of us on the platform, those administrators in West Jamaica Conference, every pastor, every leader, every elder, every member. Because we too have our challenges and our difficulties. But we know we serve a God who is God for all, and God over all. Thank you for hearing and thank you for answering. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 What a prayer. What a time we had from morning until now. And we want to say thanks to all of you who have joined us. Whatever way you have joined us, we just want to thank you. And we truly hope that you were blessed today. Thank you to our production team. Thank you to our sound engineer, our musicians, those who minister. Thanks to the entire team. Thank you to the sign language interpreters uh, for the ministry. Say thanks to Jehovah God for his blessings. Thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon our lives and worship today. And we ask you to take good care of yourselves, stay connected um, to your God and to our God. And we see you next week that much more, many more, uh, much more blessings will be available for us all. So, ta-ta, goodbye, see you next week. God bless you.